there. Welcome to my review of The Casebook of Sherlock Holmes, Series 1, Episode 1. The Disappearance of Lady Frances Carfax. This episode begins in Baker Street, with a voiceover from Watson recounting the contents of a letter he has written to Holmes, describing his time away on holiday and his encounter with the free-spirited Lady Carfax of the title. I suppose one would call her modern, except that she seems to come from an ancient line of English eccentrics. The story ends with Lady Carfax falling from her sailing boat and nearly drowning, only to be rescued by a disabled major who is also staying at Watson's Hotel. This is interspersed with footage of Holmes recreating the scene in miniature, which seems to be an effort to keep him in the early part of this story. This is yet another episode following on from The Hound of the Baskervilles where Sherlock is not the main presence for a large part of the story, giving way to a more Watson-heavy tale, as this time he is directly involved in this mystery from the start. It's definitely more noticeable when watching the episodes back to back, but I don't think it does the series a disservice. Through his storytelling, we are also introduced to an unknown horseman, seemingly stalking Lady Carfax, as well as her much more formal and proper brother, and we learn of Watson's growing unease with the strangeness of the whole situation. My thoughts return constantly to the Lady Frances. There is something about her life which prompts my sympathies. Through his letters to Holmes, we get a real sense of excitement and joy from Watson at first, as he revels in the beauty of nature, away from the smog and grime of London, and yet that only serves to make it all the more sour when he begins to worry more and more about Lady Carfax than he is enjoying his holiday. We then move away from Watson's point of view as we see Lady Carfax argue with her brother over money. As the Major, Major Schlesinger, and his wife host a lecture about their ministry work. But the rigours of his itinerary press hard upon Major Schlesinger. We shall be taking up a collection on behalf of his estimable mission, of course. As both the Major and Lord Carfax leave, Lady Carfax is once again confronted by the horseman. Leave me alone! We then cut back to Holmes, as he notices something which puts a fire under him, and he rushes off to confirm his suspicions before he makes for Watson's hotel, sending a telegram ahead of him. Watson receives the telegram and rushes to Lady Carfax's room, where she has disappeared. But Holmes is now there waiting. The way this story is structured is fraught with potential peril, as having Watson narrate his letters to Holmes, as we see what is happening in flashback, and live, as well as what Holmes is doing as he reads the letters, only to weave these complicated strands together, could have become incredibly confusing. How it's done here, though, works beautifully, as each part dovetails neatly together, creating a chronological story shown from three different perspectives. It's a real testament to everyone involved, but particularly the editor, to work these scenes together coherently in what could so have easily been a confusing mess. With Holmes on the scene, a fraction too late, and Watson quite frantic, they make their way to Lord Carfax's house, with Sherlock already having come up with three possible theories. Carfax explains he gave his sister an ultimatum to sell her priceless jewellery if she wishes to be free of him financially, and so Holmes and Watson immediately make for the bank where it's vaulted. The horseman arrives and while Holmes is distracted, Watson confronts him, calling the attention of the guards, and in the scuffle, Lady Carfax, who is also at the bank, once again flees from the horseman, 
at Baker Street, the horseman reveals himself to be her former lover, Philip Green, a poet who was paid off to leave her alone by Lord Carfax. He's since made his fortune and was attempting to let her know, which he did on the train back to London. Holmes now knows exactly what is going on and where Lady Carfax has fled to, and he fears the worst. She has gone to Major Schlesinger, who is in fact... Also known as the Reverend Joseph Covington. Amos Callow, the Dean of Maseru, and Edmund, the Bishop of Lima. A confidence trickster, and worse, a murderer, with her penchant for charity cases and Schlesinger's con being aimed at playing on people's sympathies, their only hope is to track him down before it's too late. Meanwhile, Lady Carfax has indeed gone to Schlesinger's and discovered he was faking his disability, putting her in great danger. This cross-cutting and the overall structure of the episode works really well at ratcheting up the tension. It gives a certain dynamism that is not as present in previous episodes. Holmes is usually brought in, and us with him, on an existing mystery, however far along that may be, but here the mystery and the potential danger is intertwined with his involvement. It is created under his and Watson's noses, and so they are much more reactive. Even when he discovers where Schlesinger is selling Lady Carfax's jewellery and sends Green to stake out the place, which slows the story down, there is still a much greater sense of urgency as the flippancy he often shows is completely gone now. Green sees Schlesinger's wife sell some of the jewellery and follows her first to an undertaker's where she has ordered a coffin, then to the house she and Schlesinger are holed up in, only to see the undertaker deliver said coffin. Sherlock tells him there is nothing they can do without a warrant and sends him to get one. However, understanding the urgency once again takes the law into his own hands and forces his way into Schlesinger's. This all takes place in a series of short dramatic scenes, but when Holmes confronts Schlesinger, the action slows right down and the length of the scene grows longer. The tension now coming from Sherlock's standoff with the formidable and unrepentant Schlesinger. You are Henry Peters, late Major Albert Schlesinger, veteran of the Boer War. Your further alias is I will not bore you by repeating. I'm looking for the Lady Frances Carfax. I'm delighted to hear it. If anyone can find her, I imagine you can. I have a note against her for nearly a hundred pounds. The woman's a leech. How dare you, sir? Holmes and Watson search the house and find a body in the coffin, but it is not Lady Carfax. It is Mrs. Schlesinger's old nurse, and so they are forced to leave, for fear of themselves being arrested. It's the first time we've seen Sherlock give way so easily but in context it makes some sense. The only really formidable villain he's faced off in this way before now is Moriarty, and the only way he could defeat him was with a fight to the death. He understands that someone as habitually villainous as Schlesinger will likely know the law better than the police and use it to his advantage. Previously, Sherlock has either been able to catch people in the act, been too late to apprehend them, or been able to bully them into confession or acceptance of their fate. Here, without being able to catch them or bully them, if he is too late, it will be at the expense of Lady Carfax's life, so he has no option but to stand down. Once again, back at Baker Street, both Holmes and Watson are troubled by events. But, 
As Watson remains hopeful for the best, Holmes is furious he lacks the vital detail he requires to formulate a proper theory. As Watson sleeps, Holmes continues to think, all night, until he finally realises what he overlooked, and the pair quickly head to the cemetery where the nurse is to be buried. They arrive as the service is taking place, and Holmes demands the coffin be raised from the grave and opened. As this is happening, Schlesinger flees, and Watson gives chase, shooting him in the leg to stop him. Holmes discovers Lady Carfax alive, but has been knocked unconscious with chloroform, and placed under the dead body of the nurse. Watson is concerned for the damage this may have caused her, and Holmes exclaims that he has failed. The epilogue sees Green explain in a letter how he now takes care of an almost comatose Lady Carfax, her free spirit now evaporated, and Watson tries to give Holmes comfort, which Holmes will have none of. It's only temporary. There's every hope of a full recovery. I wonder... This episode is a truly amazing achievement. Not only for the structural reasons I've already mentioned, but also the incredible character journey Holmes goes on. From being detached and apart from the mystery, both physically and mentally, to becoming so heavily invested that he takes his failure to act in time so incredibly personally. You feel it will irrevocably change him for, from here onwards. In the past, he has been annoyed that he has failed to get to the solution no one else would in time to prevent tragedy, but here it seems he is far more than annoyed. He is shaken to his very core over his slowness. He was unable to see what was going on until it was too late, and so acted with caution to make sure he had all the facts. He saw, but he did not observe, and it's a rare mistake that haunts him. It would have been interesting to see this episode a little earlier in the series, as it would help to explain exactly why he will often charge in regardless of consequence and be so willing to ignore the letter of the law. I think that's one criticism of where the story fits in to, in this evolution of this version of Holmes. From what we've already seen of the character, it feels a little out of character for him to worry about jurisprudence at this stage in the series. The other criticism I have is how Watson's character arc is somewhat uneven, as he goes from being carefree to deeply concerned to somewhat carefree again. When he confronts Green at the bank, he is overcome with anger at what has happened to Lady Carfax, and yet, by the time they confront Schlesinger, he is fierce, but also much more circumspect. While Sherlock worries himself about what's really going on, Watson comforts himself with a happy ending he's created, which doesn't feel quite right for the character. Having said that, his optimism that Lady Carfax may yet recover is perfectly in character for Watson, and highlights what a good partnership he has with Holmes, balancing out Holmes's darker instincts. The way this story ends is perhaps the most difficult ending to a Holmes story we've seen even more so than Holmes' own apparent death. We spend just enough time getting to know the free-spirited but equally caring Lady Carfax before she is struck down that it becomes truly tragic when she meets her fate, with the final shot of the episode giving us very little sign of Watson's hope for recovery. It's hinted throughout the episode that something bad is going to happen, and yet you still aren't quite prepared for when it does, which is just fantastic storytelling. This is certainly a 5 out of 5 for me, despite its issues. 
Thank you. Goodbye.